Hi. Um, I've not brought any sound examples because this is a small slot and that would extend it too far. So I'm going to talk generally about my work with the voice and speech. I have two different uh, hats as a musician. I do this uh, free improvising with my voice. If you come across me, you'll find, find lots of examples on YouTube where people uh, grab me on their phones during performances. And this is, um, I wouldn't call this speech. This is anything you can possibly do with the voice. But um, the interesting thing is that most traditions of music, when we come to singing, we constrict what we do with the voice. We, we, certain things are acceptable as song and other things are not. So you don't go <laughs> in a piece of music when you're using the voice as a singing instrument. Uh, once we go into a free improvisation, all those things are open to us. And some of them um, come out of uh, the way we use the, the voice when we speak. They also come out, out of the way we use the voice simply as animals or expressively, like vomiting, for example, the sound of vomiting. This is not speech, but it certainly, generally speaking, has not been part of music. Um, so that, that's a whole area. We can consider that, that kind of, in a way, as extended speech. The, the other interesting thing about um, looking at those sounds in terms of speech is I've come to classify sounds uh, from my experience of working with spoken sounds and extended sounds. So that comes to my second hat. My, my other area uh, of work is very nerdy. I write software uh, and I try to analyze uh, sounds. Um, I'm particularly interested in metamorphosis. How do you take one sound and tr uh, transform it into another in a way which the audience can hear? And I build musical structures on the basis of um, moving between different sonic areas. How do you get from oh type sounds to <laughs> type sounds in some way that the audience can follow? And that again comes out of lo looking at the way we might categorize speech sounds. For example, uh, obviously w uh, the normal vowel sounds, or, uh, most of what I speak, uh, are w what we call harmonic sounds. They, they have um, a some clear pitch which is moving about and the, the regular harmonics above them. They're not inharmonic sounds. They, at the other extreme, there are sibilants, and so on. Um, uh, that's the, the extreme end from the, the harmonic sounds. And then we have uh, more complicated things like, this is an iterative, where superficially what we're hearing is the same sound being repeated over and over again. It's interesting that that's not what we're hearing when you start to analyze it, but that's what it appears to be. Or, this is a very rapid iterative in the throat. And uh, so I tend to look at my sounds in terms of these categories, and I develop um, analysis and extension techniques depending on what the sound is. Uh, let, let, let me give you an example. Uh, if, if you take the sound, ah, and you want to make it longer, um, that's fairly straightforward. If you take the sound and you want to make it longer into that's very complicated. Superficially it would seem that you could take a little bit of make a little loop and it would extend it. Uh, when I first did this uh, I thought I'd played back the wrong sound. It sounds so utterly, utterly different if you do that. And it seems the brain has a natural mechanism to recognize exact repetition. So once you exactly repeat something, the brain says mechanical or electronic. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of category switch. Um, and in order to maintain that uhness of that sound, what you have to do is take it apart into the individual tongue flaps and then permute the order of them and then repeat them. And the reason that works is because each tongue flap, uh, first of all, they, although they appear to be regular, they're not exactly regular. And if you repeat them, then this is the same as that, so that you introduce a regularity. So what you have to do is take these and randomly permute them, and then they're still irregular. Similarly, this, I can't do one, <laughs> these tongue flaps, 
They're all individually different, subtly different in their spectrum, subtly different in their loudness, subtly different in their pitch. And if you repeat them, they're no longer like that. So again, if you permute them, you maintain this uh, flow of randomness through the sound. And you can, gen you, you can then generate which lasts for two hours, and it still found, seems completely natural, except for the fact that it lasts for two hours. The interesting thing then is you can begin to play with it and do unnatural things once you've convinced people psychologically that this really is a, a naturally generated sound. You can then play with it. You can make it regular. You can, uh, um, you can filter it slightly so that it becomes very pitched. You can move it around in space. You can make, make them float around in, in various ways, which are obviously not real, but they're not unreal, they, they become surreal in that you simply don't know how they're being generated. They are being generated in some natural world which you can't quite grasp. What you're not thinking is, ah, that's an interesting studio patch. I wonder which program in Max he used to do that. The, the, the idea for me is that, that that should never occur to you. You should never think that. Okay, so but, uh, let's come back to some ways of working with speech. Um, Often in my work, I've been fighting against speech because um, language imposes its own structure on the sequence of sounds, and I didn't want that. So, um, for example, it, the, the series of pieces of mine called the Vox Cycle, uh, and a very simple example is um, in Vox 3, which is a series of rhythmic games. So there are a, a group of four people, they talk, and then they begin to sing. And the, the singing uh, is the, these rhythmical games which become more and more complicated. Uh, in fact, e each singer has a click track, and those click tracks uh, are uh, related to each other in complicated ways, so the singers can sing in what become impossible rhythms, things that you couldn't do just live. You rely on these click tracks. Now, the problem with this, this piece is, towards the end, things get extremely fast. And the only possible articulation is you can't do anything else. You simply can't articulate anything else. You can change the vowel there. Uh, so on. So somehow the, the language that they're using has to evolve so those are the only consonants that are, that are possible. And so I invent the language in such a way that... Uh, I can gradually abstract from it various elements which are not going to be used towards the end. It simplifies and simplifies until I have this language which is only really only those elements. So for this piece, I, I'm inventing the language. Uh, that, that, that applies to most of the pieces I, I've written uh, for live performers because I don't want the sequence of sounds that the language imposes to be a limitation on what I can do. Now, um, uh, let, me, let me leap forward. Yes, uh, another example, um, a simple example, is the, 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 piece, the, the division of labor. Here, uh, I'm working with a text as if it is a melody. Um, I'm, I'm working by analogy, so you, uh, a, a traditional way of working in music would be to so take a, a melodic phrase, you might use it, you then might play it in the minor key, uh, more radically you might play it upside down or backwards and so on and so forth. These are transformations of the, of the pitch material. So you can do the same thing uh, with the text. You can use the text as the motivic material. And in the division of labor, I take a text from Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. It's the famous phrase about uh, the um, division of labor in a factory where they make pins. And the, the pins, the, the, the task is divided into 18 separate operations. So each person does one thing like puts white, uh, whitener on the, on the end of the pin or draws the pin out. And they do that all day. And so this is about the, the wonderful efficacy of the division of labor. Um, th there's an interesting um, uh, irony to this bit. My, my father worked in a factory, and I know that it might be very efficient 
uh, for the factory, but it's incredibly boring for the people who work there. So uh, what I wanted to do is make a piece which explored this thing, the sort of wonderful productivity of this uh, approach to production and its sort of kind of soul-destroying characteristic. So I took the text and I made a set of variations on the text uh, in various ways. I'll come back to that. Uh, towards the end of the piece, uh, the text is recapitulated. But in that, uh, at that point, I randomly permute the uh, syllables within little parts of the phrases. So you hear the same acoustic, the same voice, what apparently are the same phrases, but it no longer has any meaning. Its meaning has been stripped away. Now, in the other parts of the piece, I'm trying to show the sort of productive capacity of this particular phrase. So uh, I I'm uh, making all kinds of variations. The uh, simplest one to explain is the hocket. A uh, hocket, well, I I'll assume you don't know what a hocket is. You probably do. But a hocket is where, say, someone sings here and someone else sings in between here. Um, so it goes, dip, 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 dip. that's a hocket. Oops, sorry. Uh, now, with a computer, I can make an incredibly complicated hocket. So I can do this, and then I can put another voice in between those, and another voice in between those, until I get down to about 16 voices going past at an impossible rate. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, there's a, a, a little problem with the material, and that uh, the individual syllables have a different kind of envelope. <coughs> Many of them, like ka or ba, they, their strong point is right at the beginning. So you can line them up very exactly in time. But others, like ma, the, the loudest point in ma is a little bit after the beginning. Uh, if you line them up, to begin with, it's fine. But if you're going very, very fast indeed, that lack of... Um, accuracy about where the, so, sorry, the, the, the fact that the beginning of the sound and the attack of, the, the loudest point of the sound don't coincide means that the rhythm starts to become fuzzy. So in order to work with that material, what I did was I took the individual syllables and I squeezed them in time to about a third the size. And that, 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 that pushes the loudest point towards the beginning sufficiently for you to, uh, to be able to do this very, very accurate timing. So you get this extremely fine hocket. But in this case, I'm manipulating the speech. I'm, um, what's the word? I'm forcing the speech into my musical mold. So a very different approach then is to look at uh, the actual sonic material of the speech itself. I first did this with a piece called Globalalia, where, uh, well, I, I won't go into the history of this piece, it started as something else, but I collected together lots and lots of uh, recordings of speech, uh, mainly from radio. Uh, in fact, I got lots of friends to collect these things for me. So I had uh, speech in about 26 languages, and I started off by cutting the speech into syllables. Uh, the, the interesting thing about languages is that although there are absolutely billions and billions of words, there are very f many fewer syllables. The whole of the world's languages might be made up of perhaps 5,000 syllables. Uh, we can argue about that, uh, in, uh, about details, but there are, it's a very small class of objects as relative to the number of words. And it's also something that all these languages share, so even though you know, you might not understand Burmese. I certainly, am, sorry, don't understand Norwegian. And uh, I hope most people understand English, but I'm just relying on that. <laughs> uh, but there are certainly languages that all of us will not understand at all. So languages tend to divide people. Uh, but what, what's interesting about languages, they all share these sonic elements. So I th thought I'd make a piece celebrating that fact that we all share this material. And the piece end, ends up as a series of studies on what you can do with particular syllables. So, for example, pa, ma, pa, ba, pi, pi, ba, 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 so on. The, these are, can be used in a very rhythmic frame. Uh, you can also do very funny things with them, uh, uh, but again, I don't have the sound examples. S syllables like s and k, uh, the s can be time extended and will move beautifully in the space. 
uh, a syllable like ma uh, is uh, you can time extend and it still appears to have the characteristics of ma whereas a syllable like ka if you time extend it you get something like which no longer sounds like ka because the point about the syllable k is it's a transient. The whole point about it is it suddenly changes. And if you time extend it, it loses that characteristic. So the way you might work with ma is very different to the work, way you might work with ka. And so uh, the piece becomes a kind of series of studies of these, the qualities of these syllables. Uh, I had to think of a way of putting these, this material together uh, and I, I, I went, uh, I used as a model a literary uh, form called the, the frame tale. A frame tale is essentially uh, a story which allows you to tell stories. And the most famous example is the Thousand and One Nights or the Scheherazade story, where um, the wife of the Sultan, the, the, the Sultan has rather a large number of wives, so he's rather extravagant. He sleeps with one wife one night, then has them executed, and then gets another wife, and he sleeps with them, and so on. And Scheherazade decides this is not a good outcome. So she tells, starts to tell the Sultan stories. And the Sultan is so interested in the stories, he doesn't execute her. So she comes back the next night, and she tells another story. So this struck me as an interesting form. You have a, a, essentially a fr the frame tale, which is the story of Scheherazade, and then the stories in between, which is the story she tells. So I abstracted that into a way with dealing this, with this vocal material. We have the frame tale, which is uh, a musical phrase made up of many of these syllables uh, from many different sources. So every syllable is from a different voice, uh, but it's a kind of er speech. Uh, an utterance in the, using many syllables. And that recurs, that's a frame tail through the piece, uh, all, always with variations. And this separates these individual tales, the tales of the syllables themselves. So that's working at that, that, the detailed level of the sonority of syllables. And then decided it would be interesting. Sorry, I, I'm talking very technically at the moment because I think that's what we're probably interested in here. I could say lots of other things about the poetics of these pieces, but if you want to know about that, uh, just just ask. <laughs> so the, the, I, I decided, technically speaking, I'd like to move up to a, to a larger time scale. How would you work with the characteristics of spoken phrases rather than just of the individual syllables? What qualities might you be able to work with? Um, well, uh, the obvious things that spring to mind are the pitch contour or the melody of the phrase, the tempo and the rhythm of the phrase, and, uh, well, you still have the sonority from the syllabic material. Uh, I, I toyed with the idea of uh, trying to extract the vocal quality of particular voices. Was there a, a way of extracting the actual qualitative aspects of a voice and then presenting it so ab abstracted from the voice. Um, this is very difficult. <laughs> so difficult, in fact, uh, that uh, let, let's say for practical purposes, it's impossible. There, 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 are, there are ways of um, characterizing voices. You've probably seen these programs like CSI on television where they have this little graph. Oh, yes, that's, that's definitely that voice. It's, it's all, all down to science. Well, you can, do, you can do that. You can lo look at certain statistical indicators in voices. Um, and you, you can say, well, that, that is probably that voice and that isn't that voice. But that doesn't give you a handle on what it is about the voices that is similar. It, uh, it doesn't give you a musical handle on it. Only with certain kinds of voices. So in the piece Encounters, uh, there are two older women, and one of them had smoked all her life. So she had a voice like this. She talked all the time in this way. And you can like, abstract this uh, sound out of the voice and use it. So what I'm doing in the piece is taking the stories that these people tell and accompanying them with sounds I abstract from the voices. Uh, another, old, the oldest lady I recall, she was uh, 93. She lived on her own uh, on a remote farm. I mean, remote for England. Not for Norway, but remote for England. And 
But her voice had begun to crack. She, so she would talk like this. Her voice would crack all the time. And, but I therefore collected all these uh, and uh, breaks in the voice. And using those, I constructed a, an instrument a little bit like ba a bagpipe. Now, I, I know if there are any, I know bagpipes are a big thing in Norway, as in Scotland, and the, the place where I recorded in England. Um, this was the Northeast. And if you're a good bagpipe player, you don't do, uh, you learn not to do that. That's the whole point. But for most listeners, I'm afraid to say, that's one of the characteristic sounds of the bagpipe. So you know it's a bagpipe because it goes, uh, onto the note. So, um, uh, uh, risky it, I made this bagpipe-like instrument. And so her story, she's, she's talking about circular knitting, um, I accompany with the, the sound of this instrument, which you, you, it's, it's very clear it comes from her voice. Uh, so, uh, th th this whole piece, uh, this whole piece presented with other, other complications. Be it, when I was working with syllables, it not only um, what, well, I destroyed the words and therefore the meaning of the original material. So you, you don't hear what was said, you don't hear any narrative. You also, because I choose syllables from different people, you don't have any image of a person for, in global area because the syllables just come from many, many, many people. Once I started to work with phrases, you hear a whole phrase, it obviously has some meaning, and it's obviously a particular person. Um, this uh, created two problems for me. <clears throat> the first one was the problem of narrative. I could no longer avoid the fact that these people were talking about something. <laughs> so I decided to make a piece which was about storytelling. I, in fact, um, very carefully selected the material. We, we talked about this a, a little bit earlier. You'd go to record someone. You'd record for two hours. After about an hour and 50 minutes, they'd relax and stop performing and tell you something interesting in a natural voice. Or you'd go to the pub and they'd be showing off a bit, especially men. And they, you, a couple of pints, they'd begin to relax and then it's okay. That creates some problems in that you have pub noise which you have to get rid of and there are all kinds of technical things about that. Uh, another issue, for example, recording teenagers. Um, I went to schools and I said to the headmaster, you know all those kids who talk all the time in lessons, they're really annoying. I want to send them to this room where I have a microphone so that these kids come along who've never stopped talking all day, put them in front of this microphone, <laughs> nothing. Two kids, sometimes worked, but sometimes they didn't like each other. So, three kids, that always worked. So, but that created another problem, and they got very excited. And so, uh, you'd have one piece of speech like this, oh, wait a minute, this, another piece of speech, and another piece, of, they, they'd overlap with each other. So, another technical task in this piece was to subtract one voice from another, because I was interested in what each of these phrases. Yeah, I wasn't dealing with conversations. That's an interesting thing about conversation. I'm interested to talk about that. Um, so, uh, oh, and there was a third problem with the teenagers in that when they got talking, they would tend to talk about things that were very embarrassing, really, if they were heard in front of their parents or even their friends. Who fancied who? Who'd done what with who? And so on. Um, so when I came to use that material in the piece, rather than presenting it directly... I used a transformation technique where I, I took the, the piece of speech, I cut out the centre of each syllable, and then I realigned them so it became a, a sort of rapid rhythmic stream. It, in that, you can still hear the melody of the speech, you can still hear this vowel sequence, but you can't tell what people are talking about. You can tell it's gossip. Uh, so you get this sense of gossiping without giving away what they're talking about. So sometimes uh, technology can be used to hide things. Um, uh, yes, so, so the, the, the main content of, of the encounter speech, which we heard only the last movement um, last night, is four of these stories accompanied by sounds abstracted from the stories. Um, and surrounding those, uh, 
there's, there's a central section where I use lots and lots and lots of voices and I'm looking for ways to uh, um, integrate this material. Uh, I have the, if you like, the community of speaking voices all around you in the eight loudspeakers. And uh, I integrate them differently in the different uh, movements. So in the first movement, uh, I, did, I analyzed all this material. Uh, and that, that's, uh, uh, most of that is by hand. In other words, I went through saying, what melodic contour does this particular piece of speech follow? Um, oh, there's a lots of things we can say about following. The, I, I have, I have so, I've written software which will just follow the pitch. And I can just plug that in, and there's a pitch. But that's not quite what we mean, because if, if you record a piece of, if you listen to a piece of speech, you tend to hear no melody. You hear it go up and down, but you hear no melody. If you play back a piece of speech, the same piece of speech, and repeat it, and certainly if you repeat it twice, you start to hear a melody. We pick out a melody. And that melody is not quite the same as the flow of pitch inside uh, the, the speech. It's not exactly the same thing. It te we tend to hear it as a stepped melody, like we hear in song. That's an interesting psychological thing. But to find that, you actually have to go through and listen to it and say, yes, I hear this pitch coming in there, this pitch coming in there. And so I classified all these, um, I, I went through all these pieces of speech and I worked out their tempo, their rhythm and their pitch. Uh, very interesting things fell out of this. For example, the tempo of speech. You would imagine that uh, there would be no very slow speech. So nobody speaks, you know, nobody speaks like that. And boom, 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 boom. nobody speaks like that because you can't understand them. So what you would expect would there be no speech at this speed, and then there'd be some people who speak pretty slowly, and then there's the average kind of speech, and people who speak rather much faster, and then finally nobody here. You'd expect this kind of contour. But when I did an analysis of these phrases, I discovered this uh, a, a curve a little bit like this. I exaggerate slightly, but. So there were these two huge peaks. One of, one of them was a crotch in 120, which is roughly this, the speed of dance music. So this is what I call a phrase. This is about crotch at 120. Uh, this is another arrangement of words. This is about crotch at 180, which happens to be three over two in relation to each other. So most of the phrases that were spoken were in this tempo and this tempo. Uh, so I was able to abstract those phrases from my material. I had thousands of examples, and then align them. So the very rhythmic material you heard last night is these phrases selected from the speech, aligned. It's not me aligning them. It's, a, it's not me manipulating the, the, the rhythm of, of the speech itself. I'm just aligning what was spoken. And you get this very, very strong uh, rhythmic outcome. Another thing is the melodic material. Um, a, a lot of uh, speech is, is in a narrow, a sort of narrow band, and it makes steps kind of semitonally or in small intervals. And the, the resulting harmonic field will probably be a cluster of some kind. Uh, and I have nothing against clusters, but it can get a little bit boring. So what I could do with my database, I could go through and say, find me those pieces of speech which have very large intervals in them. So anything bigger than, say, a minor third. And I could collect this. I could say, look for every piece of speech which has the interval f from C to E flat in it and collect all those together. And in that way, I could uh, find uh, segments of speech which fell on certain harmonic fields. And I then selected those materials. And in the center of one of these um, eight-channel things, you hear these pieces of speech and they obviously fall on this harmonic field. I then put them through f filters very gradually so that they start to you know, like th to sort of shine on these uh, harmonic fields. And then finally the harmonic field separates and begins to rotate around the space. So it's like you've abstracted the, the harmonic content of the speech from it. Uh, you can also use the same filtering technique with individual speakers. So if you... Uh, figure out uh, 
the melodic line of a particular piece of speech, you can then build a filter which follows it and put the voice through the filter. Now, the, the, the filter uh, filters the, the, the speech at its pitch, but also at all the harmonics of its pitch. And what happens is, if the filter is, has a low Q, in other words, if it's not very strongly filtered, the voice has a kind of warm, warmish resonance, and that's all. But as you tighten this filter, the, all those things um, help you to recognise it as speech. So the sibilance, the slight pauses, the, the instability of the pitch disappear, and you're left with purely the melody of the speech. So you, what, what you hear in the piece is, here's a phrase, it's repeated, it's repeated, and, and as it's repeated, everything about it dissolves except its melody. It's like the smile of the Cheshire cat. You know, well, a smile without a cat. Here's a melody without the speech. Uh, and, and then, then it, the, all, the, all the speech will emerge out of its own melody. So you can work in that way. And you can also work with a sonority. So, so I, I, I look for words. Uh, again, I, I went through and transcribed everything that was said. And I could then search and say, what, what are typical... Uh, what, what are words that are used a, a, a great deal, or syllables, like mem from memory and I remember? Um, different turned out to be a, a word that was used a lot. So I took all the examples of different to make a, a different texture, which then became an if texture. Which ended up, so I could transform these textures from lots of difference into a f just a band of noise. The, the, the voice would dissolve in this noise band. So uh, at this level, there are all sorts of interesting ways to work with, with speech material. And at the very end of the piece, you, you heard last night, what I, what I wanted to do was to make these voices sing. So again, it, uh, it, it's r rather awkward to do this, but you can actually dig inside the vowels of a voice, uh, abstract them, and then um, play with their pitch uh, and all kinds of other subtle details. So the, the speakers who I originally recorded burst into song. There's one uh, finally interesting ethical issue about this. That I, I, part of the point of the Encounters piece was to record the speech of a particular community in the northeast of England. And uh, most of the people I recorded were not only not professionals, they're people who uh, knew nothing about classical music no, or serious music uh, or you know, never been to a concert, certainly never heard of electroacoustic music, what was that? They're just people who were friendly enough to volunteer their voices. So I felt constrained about what I could do. So if I'm recording a professional or my voice, I could stretch, stretch it. So it sounds absurd. I can do this with it. But I felt constrained when working with the voices of these people because they're volunteering their, 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 this material to me. Um, uh, they're not giving me permission to make them sound absurd or silly. And um, uh, the, the other thing is my wife is a social worker. So I'm aware of the ethical issue here. And so there were two things about this. I said, well, this is just a, a, a transformational constraint. I can do all kinds of things with these voices, but I cannot do these very extreme transformations which will alter sort of the, how the person appears, really. And the second thing I had to do, I had to, when I'd finished the piece, I had to go back to these communities with this material to play it to them. And I had one slightly unnerving experience. I'd gone to an old, uh, uh, an old people's uh, centre, uh, to a reminiscence group, where people gathered to talk about the, their, their stories and things, their, their past. And during this um, conversation, one of the women got very excited and animated and she started telling all sorts of slightly risque stories and things and it's really entertaining the rest of the group. Wonderful material. And I transformed it and exaggerated all these things. But then, I thought, oh dear, I have to take it back and play it. So, so I, I rang at the centre, I organised to meet her. When I got there, it was like this. There was a huge set of chairs set out and everybody who attended the centre had come to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, she took it in very good spirit. Said, mm, yes, I do tend to go on a bit. Yes. <laughs> so I was very lucky. But uh, uh, it, I, it was a, I'd taken four years to make this piece, and if any one of those people had said, "Sorry, no," 
that would have been it. So, okay, uh, I, I've, I've wandered around vaguely discussing these, these ideas about speech. I have lots of other ideas, but we've got a panel discussion, so we can talk about that later. And you all need coffee. <laughs> Thank you.